Well, welcome to um, uh, the nth Marshall Institute lecture. How many of you have been to all of them? Oh, God, I'm, I'm sure there should be special incentives. Uh, and this is, I think, the penultimate one. So uh, we have one more to go in this particular series, but there will be many series to come. <coughs> and tonight promises to be a really interesting night, uh, as I hope they all have been. So I'll just very briefly start by introducing myself and then explaining what this evening's about. So I'm Tom Hughes Hallett. Uh, I'm Paul Marshall, who you heard uh, last week or whenever it was, uh, and I co-founded this institute. Uh, and um, here we are. Uh, I've run a large voluntary sector organization called Marie Curie Cancer Care, and I've been a horrible capitalist before that. Uh, I, uh, I uh, paid for the odd cashmere jersey uh, by running an investment banking business. Um, and now I work with you, and I chair two large hospitals in the west of London. So I've become a public servant and a philanthropist. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight, which is how well do these two bedfellows sleep together, government on the one side, and on the other hand, private action for public good. Do they sleep well together? Could they sleep better together? And the great thing is we've got two absolute experts in this field joining us tonight. Uh, on my right-hand side, Jasmine Whitbread, and on my left-hand side, it's Stuart Eddington. Um, I'm not going to tell you how wonderful they are, because they are, but I thought it would be more interesting for you to hear it from them. So they're each going to just give you a little idea of how they are, where they are, uh, over five minutes each. And then I'm going to ask them some difficult questions. And then we'll open it up to you to ask as many difficult questions as you like. But I quite like being interactive, so it may be that I ask you questions in the middle of asking them questions, too. How's that? We finish at 8 o'clock, as usual. If we run out of questions, we'll finish earlier. Let's see how we go. I'm going to hand over now and thank Jasmine Whitbread for coming here tonight. Jasmine. Thank you very much. Um, so I am currently two months old in my new role as the Chief Executive of London First, which is a business membership organisation that was set up in the 90s when London was in the doldrums um, and uh, business leaders got together to see what they could do to uh, try and make it the best city in the world to do business, which it now is. Um, so mission accomplished really, although um, <laughs> I, uh, You're beginning I to believe your own story already. Well, so yes, worry. I think unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for me, um, because I like a challenge, um, just as you know, London seriously had been at the top of the charts for a number of years on, in, on a number of indicators, you're probably aware, that's partly why you're here, I'd imagine, in London. Um, you know, we have Brexit, the world's changing, and there's a bit of jeopardy now uh, back into the equation, and I love challenges. And I like taking on things that look like they might not be very easy to do, but I convince myself that they're the right thing to do and uh, I'm going to throw my all into it. So I'm very early in, in that job. I think the reason why um, I was asked to come and be part of this panel is actually because of what I did the previous 10 years, which was I ran Save the Children. First of all, Save the Children UK, uh, for five years and then during that process realized um, that something had to be done about all the different Save the Children's around the world um, that were operating in parallel, um, had been set up over the last hundred odd years um, and were in a very loose federation but with lots of replicating uh, arms and bodies so that in any one country there might be multiples. In fact, there indeed there were multiple Save the Children's. If you take Ethiopia, for example, I think there were seven different Save the Children's operating. Um, and that's just one example. Um, across 60 countries, in, in most countries, you had at least you know, two or three different Save the Children's. And so I realized, obviously, actually on day one, uh, Save the Children UK, where I was brought in to kind of turn around the fortunes of what had been a great British institution that had kind of gone off the boil a bit. People had forgotten about Save the Children. You know, people forgot actually what it did, even though the clue is in the name. 
Um, and so along that journey, I realized that you know, I, I was going to be successful in turning around Save the Children UK, but we had this big kind of elephant in the room, which was all these other Save the Children's and the inherent inefficiency of operating in that way. Um, and not to mention the risk involved in that, the lack of standards um, and, uh, and difficult accountability lines. Um, so I started talking to all of my fellow peer CEOs around the world, of which there were 30 different Save the Children's, and managed to convince them, myself and a couple of other partners in crime, managed to convince them that actually, for the good of our mission for children, we had a responsibility to join ourselves up and become more strategic, more efficient, a better partner, uh, a more coherent campaigning voice, a better place to work. Um, and better to able to reinvent ourselves, actually, to be fit for the 21st century. Um, and so that's what I did for the last five years. I ran, I actually created Save the Children International and, and ran that. Now, prior to that, um, I uh, did a number of different things, which I'm happy to talk about, but I suppose it's a little bit less relevant for what we're here to, to uh, engage in tonight. Um, I started out in the private sector, um, in business, um, in marketing, actually, in technology. I graduated from Bristol University and sort of f found my first job um, marketing business-to-business uh, -business computer software services um, and then moved on from that into line management, then worked for Thomson Financial, which is now Thomson Reuters. I worked for a little US startup company along the way. And I also did VSO volunteering. And that really was the little seed earlier in my 20s that made me think... Later on in my career, when my boss at Thompson had just sent me off to Stanford to do the executive program there, and I was away from the sort of tyranny of operations and um, saw that Oxfam was advertising for uh, eight new regional directors. And uh, they were looking for broad, lead, broad leadership and management experience rather than specific um, you know, health or education or specific hands-on experience. And I thought, right, I'm going to apply for that. There's a story behind that. I won't tell it now, but uh, I will if you ask me. Um, and that's when I really kind of made the big switch from the private sector into working in international development. So I did a few years with Oxfam in West Africa, then here running uh, as the international director, um, and then to save the children. And it's so exciting to be here and to see so many students interested in this important topic. And Jasmine, you're, you're also one of the very few um, voluntary sector chief executives who've become a non-executive director of major quoted companies, aren't you? But you yes, may be the I, only yes I, I'm, I, I'm sort of surprised, still surprised by that. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't really know why that is, but yes, it is, it is still un unusual. Of course, it's quite a recent push for women to go on um, PLC boards at all. Mm. Um, and huge progress has been made. You know, the likes of Mervyn Davies and others have really got behind that. Um, and, uh, but I think in terms of more further diversity beyond that, they're still in the, in the foothills. And your boards are? BT and Standard Charter Bank. Thank you very much. Jasmine Whitbread. Sir so Stuart Hetherington. Oh. Uh, well, it's also a pleasure to, to be with you this evening. I, um, I cannot claim to have been in my job for a very short period of time. Uh, um, I've run the National Council for Voluntary Organisations now for 23 years, um, and I didn't intend to stay that long, really, honestly. Um, so uh, um, I'll tell you a bit about NCVO and what it does, uh, if you don't know. It's an umbrella organisation, really, and, and most of the major charities are members of NCVO. It has about getting on now for 13,000 member organizations. And they're not individuals, they're organizations. Um, and it does essentially what any trade association does, which is to try and advance the, uh, create a better environment for charities and voluntary organizations to flourish, uh, both legally, fiscally, and financially, and in other ways too. Um, uh, and therefore, so the lobbies, uh, you know, spend a lot of our time stopping the wrong things happening rather than necessarily uh, getting the right things done. Some of those things are unknown uh, because they never hit the headlines, but they have stopped things happening, like protecting certain tax, tax reliefs for charities. 
Um, the second role that we play is what is loosely termed capacity building. So we provide advice and information to members and to the wider sector about critical issues to improve their performance. So better governance is a very topical subject at the moment uh, where we spend a lot of time. It seems to be a, a hardy perennial because it goes around and comes around again and again and again. Uh, the governance of charity is obviously different from the governance of companies or indeed public sector organisations. Uh, but we will provide other services, so we have something called Funding Central, which provides information about what grants are available to charities, what money is available. Uh, so generally, what we would term capacity building. Uh, and then the, the third objective follows uh, a merger which took place between NCVO and Volunteering England, uh, where we took on a much uh, stronger role uh, in promoting volunteering opportunities um, and that, <coughs> that has been an sort of additional uh, bit to our portfolio. We ourselves have um, been involved in five mergers in the last four years as public money has been slowly withdrawn, particularly from infrastructure organisations like our own. <coughs> so we're now completely self-financing and we have merged with organisations which have been have had a higher level of public funding and couldn't diversify and decided that their, their future was better with us than, than trying to stagger on as independent organisations and, and all, most of those mergers have been remarkably successful. Um, so uh, that's uh, NCVO uh, and, what it, and what it does. Uh, it has about 100 staff. They're based here in London, uh, just north of, uh, north of King's Cross. Uh, so why did I uh, stumble into this job? I'd previously been the chief exec of a large charity, uh, what was then called the Royal National Institute for Deaf People, uh, but is now called Action on Hearing Loss. I didn't change the name. I don't think I would have changed the name, but they are. I wasn't there. Um, so that's a large service providing organisation for people with hearing loss, uh, profoundly deaf people using sign language, um, and the much wider group of people who uh, are losing their hearing mainly uh, in older, uh, when they're older. Uh, so I ran that. I was Director of Public Affairs there and then Chief Executive for seven years before I went to uh, NCVO and before that I did a variety of things in mainly in policy and research before I uh, went into management, some around the mental health field, um, but um, uh, more recently generic policy work. Um, uh, I do some volu voluntary activities as well. I had the privilege of chairing a university, not this one, but Greenwich, uh, which was uh, probably the best thing uh, I've done as a volunteer um, uh, was to chair a university. I found it really quite fascinating. Um, but I've done one, one or two other things. I chair something called London United, uh, which, as its name implies, is a collection of the charitable foundations of London football clubs, if anybody's <laughs> interested. Uh, uh, and uh, they, all, all football clubs, well, most football, league football clubs have charitable foundations. Some of them are quite big. Uh, some of them run a lot of services. In fact, um, Charlton Athletic, which uh, I occasionally go to, um, uh, has a big foundation which runs a lot of Greenwich's youth service. Uh, so this is a collective of all of these from Arsenal, Chelsea down to Lane Orient. Um, and they work collectively together, unlike the teams, they're not competing. Uh, they tend to work in uh, area, uh, uh, their own areas, but they come together to run London-based programmes, example of which would be... Um, uh, a health-related program. Uh, most football supporters are in the target market for preventive care because they're fat and 50-something. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a, a pilot with Brentford, Fulham and Spurs uh, where they're issued with Fitbits and they compete with one another uh, about how many steps they're doing. So um, this is now going to be rolled out across most of the London clubs. It's an example of a joint programme and the outcome research has been done by Kingston University and there's been a significant reduction in BMI and, and health out indicators improved. 
So as an example of what they do, they do a lot of work in the dis disability field as, uh, as well. Uh, so that's what I, uh, what I do in my uh, spare time. Uh, I won't pick up the issues that NCVO is currently dealing with. I think they'll come up in questions, Tom. Thank you, and be careful before you accept an invitation for an evening to <coughs> Stuart Etherington, because his other great passion in life is putting on Greek tragedies. <laughs> Uh, around the country, isn't that right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. And in fact, I've provided them some funding, and you yeah. haven't asked me to one yet. Yes, you and have. No, I, you, you, <laughs> you couldn't come. I also, I think, I have the rather dubious pleasure of having been captured you into the voluntary sector. You were. Uh, you gave Jesus. me my first job. Yeah, You're absolutely right. Yeah. Poor old you. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, a plethora of uh, experience for <coughs> us to draw on. So I'm, I'm going to open, uh, take us back to this bedroom in which there are these two strange bedfellows, and ask you um, both the following question. In this country, uh, in, uh, short, in 1939, every single part of the hospital system was a charity. By 1948, every single part of our hospital system was operated by the state. Where shall we go in future? Was it a good decision? Uh, was there an option? And what do we feel about charities providing public services? Jasmine, do you want to kick off with that one? Yeah, I can tell you a story, actually. Um, when I first joined Save the Children UK, so we're talking 11 years ago now, um, this was an organisation that had done a lot of charitable work in the UK. Um, in fact, was invented the whole idea of school feeding programmes, um, which came from handing out milk um, I, none of you are uh, old enough to remember, but uh, handing out milk, and that actually came from a programme in Wales, in the Welsh Valleys. So, you know, here's an organisation with a lot of that kind of grew up during that area, era of um, charities doing a lot of service provision. By the time I joined it, um, they had made a decision, my predecessor and the team had made a decision that actually that was for the state to do. Public ser you know, services, provision of services, was not something that Save the Children should be doing. What Save the Children should be doing is advocating for uh, and putting pressure on government and other actors um, for the right services to be provided. And, you know, so I listened and kind of reflected on that, and it soon became clear to me that advocating not on the basis of doing any work you just become like a think tank and the power of your advocacy and the, you know, be able to actually test your ideas and actually see what works as opposed to, there is a role for think tanks, but actually Save the Children isn't a think tank and Save the Children around the rest of the world was very good at putting things into practice and then learning from them. So, um, so I actually instituted a sort of a, a back to the future move um, and uh, went off to see you know, Julia Clevenden and various other people um, who were doing great work in the UK around the thematic areas where Save the Children had expertise um, around children's development, education, health, and so on, um, and said, look, what, you know, what could we usefully, where could we usefully add value? Um, and that was a huge debate in the organisation, as you can imagine. There were like, you know, lots of cynicism that you know, one leader says this and then they swing it the other way. Um, but since then, Save the Children UK has maintained a small but large enough to be impactful um, uh, direct service provision uh, arm of its work in the UK, which makes it a much more credible player when it comes to not only central government and advocating for big policy changes, but actually in the communities. And if you're only there with your bright ideas and your you know, academic thinking, but you're not actually willing to um, roll up your sleeves and get involved, it's, it's quite hard to get you know, your, your share of the influence at the table. Um, so you know, that's, I guess, what I would see as a good model. I think it really depends on where you are in the world and what kind of social system you come from as to where you, know, where you, you are on that spectrum. My colleagues in, in, in the, across the Scandinavian countries would never go anywhere near any government money or any service provision, um, oh sorry, any service provision whatsoever for in their own countries. Um, 
Whereas in the States, um, you know, it, that would have been considered a, a kind of crazy thing to do. Um, they, you know, it was all about, you know, see the hill, take the hill. So everybody has slightly different models of change. It's not only about where you are on the political spectrum, in my view. It's also about how you think change happens. Um, and, you know, whether you're more on the kind of theoretical side of it or whether more on the practical. You know, I'm a bit of a pragmatist and I tend to go for somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Stuart, what's your view? Should, are we letting government off the hook by, uh, by uh, providing services through charitable endeavour? Uh, no. Um, I don't think so. I mean, it, you, it, these things go through phases, and the, and the boundaries between the state, the market, and the civil society, the voluntary sector, change over time, and, and depends... Uh, in part on prevailing ideologies and, and on a range of other things. So if you take, you, you mentioned 39, 45, you had essentially Fabian-inspired solution growth of the state, uh, concern with equity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, Beveridge wrote two reports, didn't he? He wrote, he, wrote, um, he wrote his great report on welfare, but he also wrote a report called Voluntary Action. So he was, I think, very well aware of the extent to which voluntary action remained important, even in the context of an expanded, uh, expanded state provision. Um, so what has happened since then? I think a lot of organizations after that uh, moved to the margin, more in the margins of public provision, and some of them combined, as, as Jasmine has pointed out, services and campaigning. So, uh, that was quite a common model over, over that period. Some people continued to provide services. And then I think it all changed. There was a famous speech given by, I can't remember who now, at an Association of Directors of Social Services Conference in Buxton. He's now in the, the Lords, I think. He, he was, uh, I can't remember who he was, um, but he was the, he was the Secretary of State for Health. Uh, which talked about the contracting environment for the first time in any meaningful way. And this became a very important component of where the voluntary sector was. Nearly half of the sector's income comes from the public sector. Uh, and over the last 20 years, that has accelerated. It used to be principally in the form of grants. Grants have declined, both in real and, abs uh, and in relative terms because contracts for the delivery of services have grown significantly. Um, and that's been a trend that has been going on for a very long period of time and seems to be impervious to political change. That, 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 that is what has happened. Uh, in more recent years, I think it's become a little bit more uh, tricky in that uh, not only because if the sector's becoming more dependent on public expenditure, it's more vulnerable to changes in public expenditure patterns, which is what happened during the, during the period of austerity. But it wasn't just that. It was also that the, the nature of contracting changed, seriously changed, for the delivery of major programs. So the, the, the work program and transforming rehabilitation were large con contracts, in general, even the large, in some of the largest charities do not operate at scale. They could not deliver those contracts. They could not win those contracts. And so they became subcontractors to major private companies like Serco, A4E, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole set of relationships have changed. So what would the future, well, you know, what, would the, what will the future hold? Um, I think there will be more of a debate about other ways of delivering services that are currently or, or that have historically been delivered by the public service. Um, there's a debate currently underway about what role volunteers play, for example, in social care, in prevention, in early intervention. So I think, um, you know, if you accept that there's X amount of tax being taken and if you accept that there's no political appetite to increase that level of taxation then uh, and you've got increasing demand as we all know we have for care services for health for others you can't necessarily square that circle in the way that you've historically d delivered 
those services, you have to look for other, other methods. Um, uh, and I think people are beginning to certainly open up that debate. That was a taboo debate 10 years ago. I don't think it's any longer a taboo. Where it leads you, I'm not sure. So uh, let, let, let's stand back from that for a moment. This is a truly international audience. Let's take ourselves out of the UK completely <coughs> and let's journey to the land of utopia. Uh, if all of you applied for jobs working for a charity or a voluntary sector organisation, would you feel rather surprised when you arrived on day one to find that the main funder of the organisation you'd signed up to with a sort of social commitment was actually the state? Would you be slightly puzzled by that or would you feel comfortable with that? Do you think it matters where the money comes from? You would, you would feel a bit puzzled by it, would you? I think it matters. Yes. So that's... And why do, why do you think it matters? Um, because if you fund the organisation, the money will the Good. Well, that leads me on to my next question. Excellent segue. I didn't brief her in advance. <laughs> so my next question is, does, does accepting state funding corrupt charities? I think it can do. I mean, uh, we had a policy at Save the Children, which I just pinched from uh, Oxfam, actually, which was to have no more than 10% of our funding coming from any one source. Um, and that, you know, the reason we had that policy was to keep ensure we could ensure our independence so that if, in any circumstances, we felt under pressure to be acting or speaking in a way that that 10% uh, donor uh, wanted us to act or speak and that felt in some way contrary to what we thought we should be doing, then we would uh, be able to walk away. Um, so I do think it's important if you say you're an independent, and, and some aren't independent, you know, but, but if you say and you want to be an independent body, um, then you have to make sure you are independent. And I, th I would say, from experience, the 10% is the maximum that you know, keeps you on your toes. And Stuart, I think I'm right in saying that the current government attempted to bring in uh, legislation to prevent charities accepting government contracts from lobbying against government, which reminded me a little bit of Communist Russia. Yeah, the anti-lobbying clause issue. Uh, this was an attempt. It, was, it came out of a right-wing think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, a, 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 a report called Sock Puppets, uh, which uh, also had another sister report called Euro Sock Puppets, uh, which was if you, if you take uh, this uh, money, uh, you should not be allowed to essentially lobby. Um, and Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. I mean, I, I thought this was a democracy. Wrong. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, uh, and this was taken up by government unexpectedly. Um, and so the NCVO, together with two allied organisations, uh, th we've never done this before actually, threatened judicial review. Um, the government lawyers told us that we didn't have a leg to stand on. However, the clause was paused the following day, so we thought we probably did have a leg to stand on, in that the lawyers were advising us one thing, but were telling ministers, you've really screwed this up. Um, and it would have been on the base, the process by which they introduced it. Um, but the, the minister concerned was then moved, um, and the clause was quietly dropped. Um, and so we felt it was important to stand up against that. Uh, ministers reassured us it was never their intention, it was a misunderstanding, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is the sort of camouflage that you get as people withdraw from a policy which is unpopular. Um, and so, yes, I mean, we pushed back. Uh, but there are, you know, there are certain constraints on what charities, charities as distinct from non-charities, can do. You know, they cannot be partisan. They cannot advocate you to vote for a particular political party. Um, and they have to campaign consistent with their charitable objectives. So there are constraints that go with seeking charitable status. Um, but uh, that, that process has been liberalised over time. Um, and that was, that was, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a real, real problem. Perhaps I could now swing the question 
180 degrees. Do you think that by working with charities, government can itself be improved? Do you think there are advantages that charities have over um, state officials in whatever country in the world that help them by working with charities? Are we more nimble? Are we, you know, what, what, well, that's what? the theory of change that uh, most in large international development agencies have, which is that, and I, I, you know, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with um, the Minister of Education in Yunnan province in China, where Save the Children had been working for a number of years uh, on um, getting uh, um, ethnic minority children a decent first uh, step into education, uh, primary school level. And um, this had gone really well, and educational achievement levels had, had really gone up, and the, the government was happy about it. Save the Children had been running these programs for some time, in a very much in a service delivery type of mode, because the, 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 the state provision had not... Well, the, the, there were schools there, but they were not catering to the ethnic minority children who didn't, who had you know, their own um, mother tongue languages first, etc. And so um, having the conversation through a translator with the Minister of Education for Yunnan Province, and I said to him, he said, this is very, very good, and I, I have just been at a conference of all of the um, ministers of all of the provinces in China, and I was telling them about what we've done here and what we've achieved. And I said, well, that's, that's fantastic. You know, this is what Save the Children <laughs> wants to hear. You know, the message is being promulgated. And I said, does that mean in, you know, maybe in 10 years' time, this might be rolled out right across China? And I paused, because it was through a translator and translator, and, and I saw him shaking his head. And I thought, oh, well, that's a bit kind of crazy. But he said, and he came back, the answer came back, no, it will be much quicker. Oh, no, fantastic. <laughs> that's wonderful. And uh, so China is our perfect government because they want to learn yeah. from, from NGOs, yeah. actually from lots of other, you know, there's some of our business colleagues might not be quite so happy about no. <laughs> what they're learning and, and taking yeah. forward. But... You know, different governments have a different perspective on that and are more willing to... I mean, I mentioned Ethiopia. The Ethiopian government has always been very tricky. Um, they don't feel that they, you know, they want to learn anything from NGOs. Um, this government is usually... depends on which government, but usually is quite receptive. Yes. But that is the model of change that Save the Children, Oxfam, all the large international NGOs espouse. They're not going to try and save every child out no. there. They're going to try and show how it is affordable and a, a, you know, a reasonable proposition that every child should get a basic uh, primary school education and then demonstrate that to governments and, and get governments to improve yeah. the way they're working to, to achieve that. Okay, very helpful. And Stuart, in your view, I mean, um, uh, do, do you think that senior politicians and civil servants in this country picture charity workers as sort of wearing sandals, shorts on a cold day, uh, yoga for most of the morning, a little bit of meditation at lunchtime, and then saving a few kittens in the afternoon? Yeah. Or do they think they could actually learn how to run the country better <laughs> from them? Well, um, I think it depends on the, the nature of the charity that you're talking about. That, that actually, uh, some charities have the model of change that Save the Children have, which is you, you run the service, you, you're trying to change, in a sense, in a systematic way, uh, because you know, you know. Others, I think, feel that they're, they're they're niche players, and therefore they will provide the services in those areas, mm -hmm. because otherwise government won't. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, in general, uh, charities can uh, and do improve government decision making. That, that actually, because they have, because they're connected with communities, because they. Uh, uh, their values driven in general as organisations, they are in a position to influence the way government... I mean, the best example that's around at the moment is the huge profile that's been given to mental health work in the last year, two mm. years. Mm. Um, you know, you've got the royals jumping up and down, wearing headbands, and uh, you've got the whole thing has shifted, um, and now government are reviewing mental health services. And that is really down to <laughs> MIND and its colleague organisations. 
Uh, and, and so whether or not there's any lasting change, I don't know, but that model of change, which mm. is uh, rooted, so I, don't, I, I do think it improves government decision making, and I think that was the, bit, that was the real problem with the, with the anti-lobbying clause, because it meant that you, you had no way mm. of influencing public policy as a result of the lessons that you were learning from providing services with public money. So that's what, that, was, that was the line we took. It wasn't about politics, mm. it was about actually improving government mm. by, with, with that information. I mean, I, I um, just to express a view on this myself, I, I, when I was running Marie Curie, uh, which was very much, uh, was very much owned by the people of this country, we didn't have many rich, big donors. Uh, our donors were probably rather like Save the Children, actually, were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people putting a pound in a, in a tin and you know, doing cycle races or, you know, jumping up and down on their head or... But people had, there was a page, period when people loved having baths full of baked beans. Do you remember that being sponsored? That I think passed it, me by. That passed you by, yeah. I think I was in another country. <laughs> good call, very good call. <laughs> but I always felt as chief executive that I always felt that I knew that someone had spent a lot of time in a bath with a lot of baked beans, getting very cold, embarrassing themselves, having all their head sha hair shaved off or whatever else. And somehow I felt an enormous burden of responsibility to take risk. And I do, for me, that is very often the difference between government and uh, philanthropy, charity, whatever you want to call it, is that I think that what charity should be for is taking risk on behalf of the people they're serving. Whereas I remember one very senior uh, permanent secretary, I, the most senior civil servant, saying to me, my main job is to stop the minister taking decisions. And I just thought, how very different to running a charity, actually. And that's why I worry terribly about charities, NGOs, getting too close to government, uh, is I think they begin to lose some of that ability to take risk. I wanted to... I'm going to open it up to questions, but I want to ask one more question. I want to... The, the Hippocratic Oath, that my son is a doctor, has first and foremost in it, do no harm. Um, I wonder if charities do harm. Uh, I, uh, I, I have a great friend called John Stone, who set up a foundation called the Stone Foundation, which you may be familiar with. So John is a very wealthy man who's given millions and millions, tens of millions of pounds to improving water treatment throughout the world. And John told me he went to an African country to uh, visit the headman in one of the villages to whom he'd provided toilets. And every single toilet was in the headman's house. So he'd provided enough toilets for the village, but they were all in the headman's house. And I just wonder whether government and NGOs, charities, work closely enough together to ensure that corruption <coughs> uh, doesn't take an edge. And I'm particularly interested in your views on this. Yeah, I mean, there's two different things. Do charities do harm? And then what about corruption? Um, they are related. But, I mean, yes, charities, do, charities are made up of human beings. And they do do harm as well as good. And I, you know, this idea that, I don't know, businesses are bad and charities are good and, you know, we're, it's, all, it's all just people like you and me. Yeah. Um, and there'll be some fantastic, brilliant people in that batch there'll be some bad people who who you know P save the children was constantly targeted actually by pedophiles wanting Absolutely. to get closer yeah. to working with children so we were constantly having to sort of mm. make it harder and harder for anybody like that to mm. to um to um get into the organization and to work with children or, and you're going to have a lot of people who you know are mainly good but will you know make some bad judgments or you know drive the car too fast and kill a goat or um, so yes I think we have to be realistic about that um, you know you, you can you can the idea of doing no harm we're, we're not angels we're, we're just ordinary people having said that you can put a lot of governance and process and checks and balances and experience into practice to try and minimise, and indeed we're required to minimise, to know what the risks are for doing the harm, to accept them, not to say all oh, that could never happen here, but to accept those risks, 
and then um, set out how in each of those cases you know, you're going to put in place whatever you can, not just from your own understanding, but also going out and learning what other people are doing, what the best practice is, to minimise those risks. And then you also have to be clear that even with those, you know, that risk reduction programme in place, stuff will still happen, whether it's funds going missing or uh, a child be, you know, not being protected. or I mean, this is serious stuff. Um, or staff not being safe or... Um, and so those things will happen because we're on planet Earth, not in that Nirvana land. And then you have to respond. Absolutely, you have to be very, very clear. Um, you have to have a complaints mechanism, you have to have a spotting mechanism, and you have to respond, and you have to be very clear that you have a zero tolerance for any, you know, any of that to be continued. And then you, there have to be consequences. So, so, you know, I don't want to pretend that it's all good news, but on the other hand, it doesn't mean that you just have to be a victim. And, and so that's more generally, and, and corruption falls within that as well. It's and one, do, one and area. Do you think, I mean, giving, again, the international spread of our students here tonight, I mean, disasters, sadly, seem to be becoming an increasing problem around the world. And we are called on to drop money into tins on the campus of the LSE uh, to support countries where a natural disaster or war is happening. Do you think we can be more comfortable than the press would have us believe that that money is increasingly getting to the ultimate beneficiary rather than staying in the sticky hands of some states? Well, for a start, it doesn't go into the sticky hands of states. I mean, NGOs don't go off to, um, you know, northern Nigeria and... <laughs> <laughs> and or hand it over to the Nigerian government. You know, they work actually in very difficult and challenging environments with very brave people to work directly with the communities. And the amounts of money involved are not like large you know, government contracts or they're, they're actually quite small and therefore don't attract the same. If you want to get rich quick in Nigeria, you don't go look for an NGO. You go, <laughs> you go and look for a government contract with a company. Um, so, you know, there isn't, there isn't this idea that you're giving money into, um, in, into, into the governments in these countries. Um, I, I think, again, I would be realistic. It depends on how worried you are. If you, if you want it to be sure that no percentage whatsoever goes anywhere, then, you know, you're not taking any risk and, no. you know, better not give any money. But if you think, yeah, you know what, I think that ma the ma I want the majority of this, I want, you know, 99.9 .9 pence to go, but I think in the, in the round there probably will be some leakage along the way um, because we're living in the real world, um, then, then I would totally reassure you. I mean, there was a case, wasn't there, with Bob Geldof on, on Ethiopia, again, it's even my subject of tonight, obviously. Poor old um, Ethiopia, yeah. Where he, he was... There was, I can't remember what it was, but there was some sort of expose that said all this money had been falling into yeah. t terrorist hands or um, you know, wrong yeah. fighting into, into the, um, uh, the, the rebels' hands. And uh, this was from Live Aid. And, and no, I mean, it was just completely exaggerated by the press. Would some, in some of the communities where, where, where charities were working, you know, would we be sure that every single person there, nobody had any contacts with, you know, in the, in the, in the food line with the, with the, with the mums and the children, that nobody had any contacts with some of the rebel forces? No. no. Um, so, yeah, it's exaggerated. But I also don't want to pretend it's all perfect either. Thank you. I'm going to throw this open now to... Uh, I was about to say the congregation. I thought it was sounding like a bishop. Uh, so, microphones at the ready. Gentleman at the back. Lady at the front. So, we'll start with you. Second mic over here, please. It's on its way. Thank you, ladies, for the microphone. Very much. Yes, sir. So, hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you spoke about the politics of private action but you actually mainly spoke about uh, charities or uh, the philanthropist sector. I wanted to know what you thought could be the linkages between uh, the growing corporate social responsibility and the charity sector in order to go towards public benefit. Okay, I'm going to give Jasmine a quick rest because that's what she's doing for 
working with as a non-executor at two corporates and let you come in first on yeah, that. Yeah, oh, thank you, Tom. Um, I, I've always envisaged CSR policies as going through various stages. Stage one was always the uh, chairman's whim phase, uh, which was the chairman quite liked opera, so the Royal Opera House got quite a lot of money. Um, you then went through a stage of uh, almost strategic marketing, actually, which was um, uh, we do this and we want to align our brand values with charities that are associated with that brand value. I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, one uh, the sort of other stage of development has been corporates applying their skills for public good. Uh, sometimes with charities, sometimes directly, but they will often have a skill set uh, which they feel is, is it of itself of public good. Um, and it's a two-way street. I mean, for example, uh, employee retention is a big issue for a lot of companies. Uh, a lot of people want to work for companies who are engaged in responsible activity. Um, and the CSR agenda is, is, is wider. So it's environmental policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it, it's now, uh, I think, embedded in a lot of corporate psyche that they have to be responsible citizens for a whole range of business-related reasons as well as, as well as just to, quote, do good for public benefit. Um, so I think it's, it's embedded in a slightly different way in, in companies now. But uh, So before I hand over to Jasmine, we're going to have a vote, and I'm going to ask you to be incredibly honest. Okay? I'm going to ask you, when you leave this fine um, School of Economics, <clears throat> if you're offered a job, I'm going to take a number out of the air, paying you $40,000, right? And somebody else offers you an identical job at $37,000, but they have a stronger corporate sense of responsibility to society. Will you sacrifice $3,000 in salary? Who would sacrifice $3,000 in salary? That's amazing. You really mean that? That's so good to hear. And who would like to buy a house and get a mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, be honest. <laughs> All of you. <laughs> Jasmine. Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of points. I, I think that when we, you, you're right, we have been talking more about charities. I personally don't like that nomenclature, but anyway, that's the one we've got. Um, but um, I think it's important to realise that for a lot of big, ch well, let's, let's talk about Save the Children, that's one I know, but it's the same for Oxfam, it's the same for many others. Um, the income sources and indeed the programs that they run are funded through a whole range of philanthropic donations um, and corporate philanthropy is part of that. And indeed, that was one of the things, having coming from a corporate background, that I was very keen to um, tap into more, first at Oxfam and then at, at Save the Children. And then individual, private individuals um, giving major gifts, uh, private philanthropy um, is also, um, in fact, when it was Oxfam, it was a very tiny part of Oxfam's portfolio. Um, but I, again, I, I mean, I, with my background, um, I was looking for where the funding sources could be because also I was allocated to West Africa, which is sort of off the kind of geopolitical charts in, in terms of British fundraising. So I was sort of more hungry, I think, than some of my other regional directors. And I went off and I remember finding the head of philanthropy um, tucked away in a little corner of Palmer House across the road from the main building in uh, Summertown in, in, in Oxford. And uh, I went and sort of knocked on his door. It wasn't open plan in those days. And um, lovely gentleman, he, he was, couldn't believe it that a regional director had come to see him <laughs> and uh, was interested in what he was doing. What you looked um, like. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I was like a visitor More from species. another planet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it really was not a, you know, it, it was not front and centre. Um, and I've seen that completely change. I mean, this is going back some time now, this is 16 years ago. It's completely changed now. I, I mean, I haven't been back to Oxfam to visit the head of philanthropy recently, but I'm sure he or she has got a corner office and a whole retinue of people, you know, trying to get into their diary. 
Um, and it's become a much bigger thing. Obviously, in different parts of the world, it's different again. I mean, in the States, philanthropy, in private philanthropy and corporate philanthropy has been much bigger for much, for much longer. Um, and I think the key is to, to you know, I, I don't think it's either or. Um, it's private, corporate, um, the mass giving of everybody sort of giving small amounts of money is hugely valuable as well, as is the, the government. Um, so that's you know one clarification that I would make. Just a small point, Tom. Yeah. It's a relatively smaller part of the total charity income. It's about one percent, um, and the vast majority of philanthropy is uh, the same as Tom has mentioned in Marie Curie. It's high volume, low value. That's that's the bulk of UK. income. U UK. Yeah. But. Uh, personally, I think the model's broken in this country, uh, in this country. Um, Stuart described the journey so far. I think we're looking for the next evolution because my children are your age, a little bit older actually, probably, uh, and they will not work for organizations that don't have this at their heart. And actually, it's not about giving. It's not about money. It's about the way the organization operates and works. And I'm working with a group of very senior executives at Unilever at the moment. And Unilever are really doing amazing, amazing work in this area. But they're ruthlessly clear about it, which is they will support you to do social impact work. But it has to sell more soap powder at the same time. And that's where they've been very, they're very honest about it. So I'm working with a, a, a group of people who are trying to take from the Indian plastic recycling dump plastics, because so much of Unilever's product is condemned, if you like, for being in plastic, and turning it into a new range of rubber gumboots, well, boots. And now I'm bought, introduced them to a small company called Muddy Puddles, which makes children's gumboots. And we're trying to put the whole thing together to everyone's benefit. And I think that's more the way you want to work rather than see a rather distant board in Unilever write a check out to a charity. Am I, am I about right? That's what I thought. Okay. Next question. Uh, I'm going to go over to this side of the room uh, for one microphone, but you first because you were up earlier. Thank you. <laughs> thought maybe you'd forgotten me. That's right. Um, what you just said actually segues nicely to my question. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll try to boil it to one. It's one only. Yes, exactly. It I'll seems come back to you later if we run no out. No worries. Um, it's just so fascinating. Uh, it seems to me that when we look at, wi at some of the challenges we face in attracting more philanthropy or more funds, whether they be corporate or from individual funds to, um, to public work, that there are two main issues. One is that um, individuals or companies don't think that charities are run effectively or with sufficient transparency um, and therefore uh, might not want to donate and that they don't understand that charities face many of the same challenges that corporations face particularly when they're of large scale as you mentioned um, and therefore they take just as much and uh, they have just as much a need for investment in their staff and in attracting the right staff to run it effectively as they do in focusing on the strategy to achieve the mission. So my question is, and given those two issues, do you think that charities um, should be run more like businesses? And I'm not necessarily suggesting that they should be. I welcome your thoughts. Um, and if so, should we be attracting staff that have a proper balance of both private and public sector, much like your experience indicates? Jasmine. So um, I think that uh, charities should be run professionally. but. When we talk about businesses, there are a whole yep. range of differences of businesses, and there are well-run businesses and badly run businesses and big businesses and small businesses and microscopic um, entrepreneurial businesses. And I think that's the same as with, with charities. Um, but I think, you know, what, both if it's a business or a charity, it should be professionally run. It should be ethically run. It should be professionally run. There should be accountability. There should be transparency. When things go wrong, there should be consequences. Um, so, yes and no, I guess. And then, Stuart, the second part of the question, should we be looking to see more people from the public and private sector working inside the voluntary sector? 
Uh, yes, and, and I think in general that is, that is happening quite, uh, quite a lot now. There's no sort of pathway that says once a charity worker, always a charity worker. There's a lot of people come to the charity sector from the private sector, um, particularly in things like marketing and fundraising. That's quite a common uh, move across, and in finance as well. Um, and from the public sector, most of the pub people that try to come to the public sector, uh, uh, public sector have transferred across as a result of contracting, actually. That, that's been the principal yeah. way in which people have come across. But I do think transparency is a big issue. If you look at the challenges for the charity sector over the last two years, um, they've been an odd thing in the sense of questioning some of the professionalism of charities, because I think the perception of some members of the public is that nobody's paid. Uh, and nobody, you know, so you had an issue about salaries, you had an issue about fundraising techniques, and you have an issue about charities not being able to demonstrate the impact of what they do. These have been, apart from campaigning, which was more of a politically motivated issue, those issues have, have emerged, and we did some work on salaries. And it was very interesting, you look at the post bag, my, my for, former chairman, Martin Lewis, chaired that group. If you look at his post bag in relation to that, it showed that the, some, I think reasonably significant members of the pub, uh, numbers of the public have a perception of charity which does not relate to the professionalised large charities that I think exist and do quite difficult things. Uh, it's more, well, we didn't think any of you were paid. You know, there's a, there is a, a, a perception, maybe it's the word charity, interestingly enough. And indeed the phrase voluntary sector, which mm. also isn't very helpful. Have you got the right word? I've always wanted to know what it should be. No, I don't. No. And the reason... No. That, I, mean, I thought you were going to say yes. I'm people terrible. would often say that, and, and every now and again people would say, well, let's, you know, let's call ourselves a, you know, a positive action. Or a, you know, so, and, and, and I suppose the trouble is I'm not motivated to come up with a new name, and, and neither, neither is anybody else. You know, most people join these organisations to go and have some impact rather than coming up with a better yeah. set of words. An NGO. Well, it tends to apply to development, yeah. uh, the, the word NGO. Do you know so what? We could be here all night talking about the names. Kids. Well, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I, um, I, uh, I, uh, I think we'll move on from that. In, in the States, they're called non-profits. Yeah, I quite like that. Yeah. So... Hello, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask more about uh, innovation and taking risk that we were discussing uh, earlier. And given that charities aren't subject to shareholders or making profits, they need to somehow measure what they do. And we've been touching on this point a bit. So what are the uh, best ways for charities to measure or evaluate their results and be very transparent about that. It's especially very large organizations like Save the Children that consistently get poor scores from GiveWell and other kind of evaluating organizations about lack of transparency uh, in especially being able to determine like if I donate, where exactly is that dollar going to go? How will it be spent? Uh, and having very specific measurable impacts of programs. Um, and then looping that back to where I started on innovation, uh, might it be better for organizations to be smaller and more specific potentially, to be more agile and be able to measure specific things and work on only a, a select couple of indicators potentially as a solution? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break that into two questions. So. Uh, we, we, I'm going to take the first half, I'm going to ask Jasmine to answer, and then I'm going to ask Stuart whether the obsession with scaling everything is a good thing, is small beautiful, or is big even better? Jasmine. So the approach I took, um, that I've taken from the sort of private sector into the, um, let's call them non-profits that I worked for, um, was to, to ensure that we set out in advance our best um, go at what it is that we want to achieve and to have some qualitative and quantitative um, measures included in that. So, you know, if we're trying to you know, do a program on um, saving newborn lives, you know, ha how many newborn lives do we want to save? 
Um, and what do we mean by that exactly? Because, you know, you can save a life today and then they die tomorrow, so we're going to save that life, you know, several times over with lots of... So you, you have to have some definition around the quantitative and also some qualitative in terms of, you know, um, how, how um, in-depth that intervention has been, um, how su um, sustainable it will be, how, uh, um, uh, how replicatable and so on and so forth. So I think you know, the key thing is to set out some targets, not always numbers, I mean, you must have some numbers in there, um, and then you measure yourself against achieving them, and you mustn't be af afraid of being clear where you fall come, you, know, you, you measure up short. Yeah. And I think that's why people worry about setting the target. Well, first off, it's difficult to set those targets, especially to aggregate them. So, you know, the, the point about big, the bigger you are, in a way, it's harder, because if you measure uh, targets on saving children's lives, and yet you're measuring what that, how you do that work in um, Haiti, as opposed, you know, a plus, how you do that work in um, you know, parts of Australia, um, <laughs> it's, it's, re it's like adding up apples and, and, and oranges, so it's quite difficult to aggregate that up. So I think people are wary of doing it because it's difficult, it requires resources. I think, you know, where you, partnerships actually with academic organisations can help in doing that. Um, and then you, people are worried about saying, we, you know, we can't make that goal because we might not meet it. Um, but I say that's fine. Just, you know, explain why and, you know, calibrate and, and manage expectations. So that's the approach that I, I try to take. Before I pass over to Stuart, um, have a look. I'm a partner in an organization in America called Acumen, which is absolutely the forefront of looking at this at the moment. And there's a wonderful young guy called Tom who's actually based in London and who very kindly did some teaching for us on Professor Ashraf's course last week, who's coming up with some very interesting measurement of impact by getting the people being affected to text in on mobiles, on whether it's made a difference to them or not. Uh, and uh, some quite interesting stuff. Anyway, have a, have a Google, Acumen website, and look at impact. And you, you may find your way through to what Tom's up to. We might get him to give a lecture, actually. Uh, in our next series, because he's doing some great stuff. Stuart, big or small? What's best? Right. Um, well, f firstly, in, in the UK, uh, the sector's made up of a few large organisations and a vast number of small organisations. The vast majority of ch charities have a turnover of less than £50,000. They don't employ staff. They're very local. Uh, in some ways, the, uh, the shape and the ecology of the sector is shaped by its funding environment to a certain extent. Um, so, for example, uh, we, every year we produce something called the Civil Society Almanac, and it's probably the best source material on what's happening within the sector. And, it, and a lot of it is about the funding environment for the sector. Um, and interestingly, the last one we did, it, despite austerity, the sector had increased the, the amount of public money in it. But it had all gone, all of it, to charities with a turnover of 100 million plus and there's a very small number of them. And the reason that that has happened, in my view, is the nature of the contracting process. So it is driving organizations to scale. If you, if you haven't got scale, you can't compete for large-scale government contracts. Um, the, it, 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 it's also influenced by the fact that the, the organizations that have taken one of the biggest hits in the spending reviews has been local government. Local government is the principal funder in grant terms of small local charities. So they've been hit by that as well. So um, it, do, it does, uh, and I, I personally think it's in some ways there's a false argument that actually for certain types of activity, uh, you wouldn't want a small community organization attempting to fish refugees out of the Mediterranean, would you? I mean, you know, you've got to have scale, you've got to have professional systems. But similarly, Smaller organizations, I think, are working uh, well in local communities uh, and they function in different ways. One of the interesting things is the extent to which they are concerned now about the predatory behavior of larger organizations, not just corporates, but also uh, larger charities, actually pitching for contracts against local organizations. And that's a phenomenon that I've heard of. There's no data in relation to that, but it's a, it's a phenomenon that's 
I think, going on in certain areas of activity. I, 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 would, I, would, I would say that um, this is a really interesting area, and it's somewhere that I think, over time, Marshall may do, uh, the Institute may do some work on, because I'm really torn about this one. Our, 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 my, my, my great uncle created the mutual fund movement in this country and made a fortune and left his entire fortune to set up a charity called the Esme Fairband Foundation, which my brother and I are trustees of. Um, it's awful when that happens, because everyone expects you to pay for dinner, because they think you're incredibly rich. And however much you tell them that your great uncle gave every penny away to charity, they never believe you. But we don't support large charities, because we've actually found that we get more bang for our buck very often with the passion that's still there at the beginning of the journey. So we've, some of you may be familiar with Teach First, which is an example in education. We set were set up by London First. Set up by London First, and the first funder was Esme Fairbairn. So there you are, a great combi. But actually, it's that early bit of the journey that is, and I've set up two charities this year, and I'm really excited about both of them. And there's a funny bit of me that dreads the, the day, should they be successful, they become very large. It's just a funny bit of me, because perhaps some of the excitement will go. Madam, madam, two madams, three madams. Okay, we've got three activists here, so um, uh, can we have a, some mics? And then a microphone uh, for the lady there in the white, with the white scarf. While we're just circling the microphones, when I first gave a lecture at the LSE, I was warned to be gender neutral and never to say lady or gentleman. And I did really well for the first 89 minutes of the lecture until a man with a very large beard stood up. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I thought, I think he's a bloke. <laughs> so forgive me, I shouldn't have described your sex. So people, people, please, over we go. Um, I was a little bit surprised when Sir Marshall last week, and I think to some extent tonight you guys touched on as well, portraying government as sort of this antiquated, slow, bureaucratic mess of an organization that is in stark contrast to the charitable industry or nonprofit sector or even the private sector to some extent, which is young and energetic and innovative. And I'm wondering if that dichotomy, which I would perceive as false, is to some extent- You think Stuart and I look young? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just, I think that perspective of the civil service is in some regards encouraging us to opt out of democracy. Good for you. And instead, shouldn't we be encouraged to lean into the civil service and to learn the lessons that you've demonstrated from the charitable sector and the, pr the, the private sector as well? Shouldn't we be encouraging our government to function more in that capacity rather than opting out of that system for an Best question of the evening so far. Get a special star. Stuart. Yeah. Um, I, I don't Why are you being so rude about civil service? I'm not being rude about civil service. <laughs> They're giving you a knighthood. I love civil service. <laughs> uh, they, um, um, some of my best friends are civil servants. The, uh, um, uh, the, um, I don't think the, the, the sector is necessarily particularly innovative. Uh, I think you know it can be but it isn't always. And I think sometimes government can be and sometimes isn't. So I, I, don't, I don't think that that dichotomy, you know, we're all brave, innovative, flexible, marvellous people and they're all complete, utter uh, waste of space. I, I don't take that. I think there are different, there's a different accountability structure in there. And you're, you're right, one is a democratic accountability structure. And the accountability structure of charities Voluntary organisations is, is is very different, um, and both can get stuck. So I do, I do think uh, we have a program called a day in the life, and this program is basically for civil servants to spend time in the charity and for the charity to spend time uh, with the civil service, and it's it works both ways, and I, I think it's quite an innovative. It teaches people a little bit about how different systems work, um, but I think. I think picking up the point that was made before, I think there is a tendency to be more risk averse with public money. Um, because a lot of people fear, what, what's the select committee that every civil servant fears? It's the public accounts committee. Uh, and that's because they will ask serious questions about right risk risk. I was once told, I'll finish this point, I was once told uh, by Greg Clark, who's now a cabinet minister, that when he was on the public ac accounts committee, the, the question that you were to always told to ask was, before, you, uh, uh, b before this was brought to the committee's attention, were you aware? 
of this problem. And if you said, yes, I was, the answer is, well, why didn't you do something about it? If you said, no, I, was, I wasn't, the answer is, well, you should have been. So uh, uh, that drives a risk-averse culture. Uh, and, and I think it is, it is more difficult for, for people in the public service to take risk. Do both. I've just taken two secondees into the Marshall Institute uh, from the civil service. Uh, to help with one of the charities that I just set up. So uh, do both, and please become civil servants. <laughs> Otherwise, countries would not operate. Uh, I'm going to the, your question, and then I'm going to come to you, and then you, and then you other. Okay, yeah, let's go, come on. We're going to do three questions now, because I'm watching the clock. So we're going to have your question first, and then we'll answer them together. Yeah. Cracking good question. You may have just taken away the gold star from there. <laughs> Next question, coming over here. And then I'm going to come back here for the third question. So do you want to have the microphone? We'll come back to you in, a, in the next, next round. Yep. Great question. Third question. Um, I had a question on your personal motivation. So why did all of you start out in the private sector instead of starting out in the charitable or in the public sector? And how did this change for you come? So how, how did you decide to suddenly go from marketing into Oxfam? Did you have acquired certain skills or did you think um, you had enough money to be able to afford working in a less Okay. well-paying sector, or was that a long-term goal that you had in mind? Before? Good question. So the way we're going to do this, you're going to do Charity Begins at Home. I'm going to ask you about investment and why we're so obsessed about how much money is deducted for costs effectively, and I'll try and answer the third one. I don't think we're going to have time for all three of us. So, right. Do you want to go first? Um, so investment, um, y yes. I mean, it, it is frustrating. Um, you know, the the computer systems that we had at Save the Children were just, you know, the dark ages, really. And, to, to, you know, this is a $2 billion operation, you know, working, spanning 120 countries of 25,000 people. And to run that effectively, instead of just the, this, this big glob, <laughs> which you don't really know what's going on, to run it effectively and really know what's going on, being, you know, have those feedback mechanisms and be able to add things up and be more transparent, etc. You've got to invest in proper systems and processes and, and, and people. And uh, no, we were always chronically, chronically underinvested. Um, and I think... The, the challenge comes back to the sector actually doing a better job of explaining that. Um, and you know, be, being, being brave, I think there could be more leadership from the sector in terms of being brave to explain exactly what is going on here. And the fact that it isn't all just sort of, you know, four pounds and this child will be, you know, in heaven for the rest of her life, you know. And, and you know, it, 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 it's just not as simple as we portray it. Um, and um, so they re you know, we always do try and sort of keep it 80-something pence in the pound it actually gets out to the program. Um, and there have been lots of efforts to try and address that, um, and they haven't really been successful, address that perception issue, and they haven't really been successful. It's an ongoing issue. Isn't it funny, though, if you think about it, if, if, if you have three pounds to give away, are you, more ha are you happier that that three pounds goes straight to feeding a child who needs food? Or would you like to create 10 pounds out of it by funding fundraising 
So there's seven pounds available to feed children who need food. And it, it is bizarre that we've got, and I, I completely agree with Jasmine about this. I think the sector has been really hopeless at dealing with this, and frankly, not helped at all by the press. Mm. I mean, on this, I feel slightly Trump-like. I think there are alternative facts <laughs> uh, that uh, the sector would be well advised to, to get over. I'm going to ask you about Charity Begins at Home now, Stuart. And the first question is, did you understand the question? Uh, yeah. Good. Um, uh, um, uh, I think you, you asked about different audiences in relation to that, and I think different audiences has different, have, do occasionally have different perceptions. So I think the public show their generosity in, in relation to causes that are not just at home. They respond to emergencies, they, uh, they fund organisations which are doing development activity. So I think there's a genuine, I think there's a perception in the public that charity is not just about at home. Uh, I, I think the media sometimes rocks that boat and there's a political side to that. Uh, the example that I would cite is that when the salary stuff took off, it was a very specific story. Uh, it was about the salaries of charities that were engaged in overseas development. The story was all about their leaders, their, their chief executives, uh, their fundraisers. Uh, and the story, interestingly, was a Telegraph story, and it was based on a survey by one Priti Patel, who is now Secretary of State at DFID. Uh, and I think that was bound up with the why are we giving 0.7% aid budget, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there was a genuine attack, or politically motivated attack, on development organisations of which salaries was an element. So I think for some elements of the political uh, environment, uh, then there is more of a question of charity begins at home, et cetera, and trying to stimulate that. I'm not sure that there's much resonance in the pub with the public about that particular issue. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I was also interested to note that Priti Patel thought the department that she now runs should have been abolished, which is an interesting observation. Isn't it? Let me give you a tip. On your way home tonight, I was taught this by a member of the Church of England. On your way home tonight, when you see a big issue seller, instead of passing them by, do the one thing that no one ever does. Stop, give them money, and talk to them. Don't give them money. Give the money and talk to them. And you will get more personal pleasure out of that act than you will out of anything else you've done this week. And uh, I think Paul closed his lecture uh, last week with a quote from St. Francis of Assisi, which said, by giving you shall receive. I'm not trying to be a religious preacher here, but actually the act of giving as an individual is one of the most pleasurable things mm. And I don't think one should be as ashamed of it being pleasurable. The other thing I always ask people to do is to knock on the ne their next door uh, neighbour's house and say, um, I'm, I'm John. Uh, do let me know if there's anything I can ever do to help. And the number of us who do that in cities is tiny. Uh, who's American here? Well, you put us all to shame because you're so good at doing that. And whenever there's a bereavement in towns in America or someone has something horrible happen to them, the food appears, the pies appear on the doorsteps. In this city and in the city of Paris, I think are the two most unfriendly cities in the world. We're just not very good at it. So uh, I think charity begins at home. And in answer to your question, uh, I'll just give my answer, which is um, in 1999, I was running the 12th largest bank in this country I had an enormous chauffeur. I was coining it. I could afford many cashmere jerseys as I wanted. I could go to exotic holidays. Uh, but when my children said to me, Dad, do you remember when we had that wonderful bit of fun uh, playing cricket in the field or something? I said, yeah, that was a wonderful day. And they said, no, Dad, you weren't there. And then in my life, I've had a wonderful life. I've, I still have a wonderful marriage and three lovely children. But two things happened to me. One, very sadly, one of our children died. And secondly, I had a nervous breakdown in 1990. And from those two things, I learnt one very important thing, which is you have to live for today. And being richer than any of your friends in financial terms is a completely meaningless proposition. But you need to be rich enough to buy that house first. 
and you need to be rich enough to put money in, 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 into your uh, housing, housing allowance or whatever else, and you need to feed your family. But there comes a moment in your life when you don't need to do that any longer. So you don't have to become heavily involved in not-for-profit when you're 23. You can do it when you're 83. So I don't want you to think this is an, a, a binary choice where you either do it or you don't. You can actually do it all the time while still earning good money and enjoying the jobs that you may be being uh, equipped for in being here at the London School of Economics. Or you can do it straight away. And by the way, we've talked a lot about people in, in this not-for-profit world. I'm sticking with it, actually. I like it. In this not-for-profit world, being perceived by their friends as not, earn, not earning anything. Let me tell you, salaries in the not-for-profit sector are perfectly fair nowadays, aren't they? I mean, you know, you, you assume, don't assume that they're... I mean, they are a tiny bit less than at Goldman Sachs. Uh, but uh, do you know what? The discount is worth it. And as you said earlier when I asked you the question, you wanted the discount. Go and grab it. I'm just wondering if that's a good place to end, actually. We've, we've got another five minutes, if you want. Is there, is there anybody else who burning to ask? Yes, I promised you we'd take yours. So we'll take your question and your question and, and yours. So three more questions and then we'll close. So quite quick, please. Rapid fire. Hi. Uh, do you believe the current corporate CEOs have uh, become slaves of the shareholders? And if yes, uh, do you think uh, people should follow the Unilever model where Paul Paulman said that I don't care for the short-term shareholders, they can take a walk. We'll only publish annual reports and no quarterly reports. Would okay, that so, I, uh, so here we're really talking about for-profit organizations or charities for as well. The reason for him to stop being slaves of the shareholders was because the short-term uh, view was ruining I'm the I'm going to let Jazz say, uh, 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 in your private company world, are you a slave of the shareholders? Do you always have to think incredibly short-term? We'll come, right, first question. Second question. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, this is a uh, friendly challenge to uh, Sir Etherington's assertion that uh, government is uh, risk-averse. Um, and Mar Mariana Mazzucato writes about this uh, in relation to business and innovation. Um, I wonder whether uh, governments have the long-term outlook and the stable funding to be able to fund innovative uh, public benefit projects, and that may be the reason why we have the NHS or Finland contemplating a minimum basic income. Great stuff. We've got a very strong pro-government lobby here. I'm liking this. <laughs> and then the third question is over here. Hi. I just wanted to ask about how the non-profit world is reacting to like, the digital age. So for instance, a lot of like, online giving platforms, which also tend to benefit sometimes not even small charities, but just individuals mm. who are like, in a very bad state, as well as what you think about gimmicky social media challenges, especially like the ice bucket challenge. Do you think it's a way forward or it's a one-off success? Okay, so we've got, um, our g we've, we're back with the government again. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you that one, if I may, Stuart. And then over here, we've got, are you driven more by short, the short term than the long term? And then we'll have some fun at the end about technology and clothes. So let's go, let's go here okay. first. Um, so the boards that I sit on um, do have to think about our shareholders, obviously. But I don't want you to think, and we do actually do quarterly earnings you know, results. Um, but I don't want you to have the impression that that's you know, the driving uh, decision-making force um, on those, and indeed, I'm pretty sure, on other company boards as well. Um, you know, at BT, we spent a good deal of time talking about what is our purpose as a company. Um, and, um, you know, lo lots of debate around that and eventually came out with, we th we, you know, we believe in the power of communications to make a better world. And we think that, you know, we, we have a responsibility to not just in f through philanthropic giving, but through everything that we're doing, that we, you know, we are going to try and use communications in a positive way um, to make that better world and to define the different goals within the strategy in, in line with that. Um, so, you know, I go back to my point that I made earlier. I think that there are well-run companies and poorly-run companies. 
big companies and small companies, and that all applies to nonprofits as well. Um, and I think you know, it was brave of Paul to do that, and I think it was helpful. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I think there were a certain set of circumstances that enabled him to do that with Unilever. It's a shame that more people haven't followed. Um, but I don't think that even, even where that isn't in, in the case, it doesn't mean that companies can't be more purposeful in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Thank you. Stuart? Um, I think uh, the, you talked about long-term thinking, really. Um, and I used to think that that was the benefit of our civil service, that it was taking a very long-term view of some, of some of these issues. My experience of the political world is that it isn't very long-term. It's actually driven by electoral cycles, uh, about what is popular at a particular time, about you know, the worst one for the voluntary sector or non-profit sector or whatever, um, is it's got to be innovative. Mm -hmm. So government keeps reinventing things uh, because they've got to have thought of something new um, rather than building on what necessarily is always there. So I'm not sure that I buy the, the sort of long-term thinking argument. Um, I think, if anything, there's been an increase in short-term, and 24-7 media makes that process even more dramatic, I think. Particularly when we're in a world now where leaders of large countries make decisions without even consulting their long-term thinking civil servants, and when they've only been in power for 12 hours. <laughs> so um, uh, that was a politically neutral point. The, uh, and I'm going to answer yours, and then we're going to close. I, I, I want to be slightly provocative. Um, I have a very clever soon-to-be son-in-law called Daniel Suskind, who gave a lecture, I think, in this hall, actually, just recently. Dan has written a book called The Future of the Professions, which is slightly taking the world by storm because he's, he's predicting uh, that uh, the accountancy profession will not exist quite soon. I want to suggest to you, perhaps, that charities may not exist. At least if they don't think about the fact that they might not exist. Because if you look at some of the great philanthropic acts, they didn't actually involve creating charities. They went straight from the philanthropic aim, which was to increase the public good, to achieving it. And I'll give you my favorite example, which is Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't actually exist. It was started in the 1930s in the United States, uh, and it's now worldwide. It has as high an impact for dollars spent as probably any charity in the world. It's global. It raises no money. It has no headquarters. It's entirely a social movement. So there's nothing new about social movements. They've existed for a very, very long time. There were some very good social movements started in the 18th century in this country. I predict that in the near term, donors will want to give time, and this goes back to your question about charity beginning at home, donors will want to give directly to the beneficiary, either of their time or their money, and may look to disintermediate voluntary sector organizations, not-for-profit organizations, that don't add value beyond brokerage. Does that make sense? And I think it's going to be an absolutely fascinating trend in the years to come. And one of the reasons for that is, was illustrated to me this morning. I was with a brilliant young man who's just been working with one of our three largest charities in this country. And he told me that in his two weeks of working there on an, uh, an assignment they'd asked him to do with the senior management, the cause of the charity was never mentioned. The only thing they talked about was the organization itself. In other words, it had become self-serving. So I think technology can lead to a good challenge to the passion, the compassion, the impact and effectiveness that to me is true philanthropy, charity, not-for-profit, NGO, whatever else we want to call it. Thank you all for coming. A particular thank you to Jasmine, and to Stuart, and thank you.